asifiwe. Come on, Bwana Yesu asifiwe. If you can give a high five to someone that's seated next to you, tell them Jesus loves you. Or turn to another and tell them Jesus loves you. Hallelujah. Well, what an honor and a great privilege it is to stand here today. As has been said, my name is Brian Moshigadi. I'm born again. I love Jesus, and Jesus loves me. This I know. Amen. Um, today we're going to be talking about the theme of love. We're beginning a fresh new theme in the month of, uh, of November, and we're going to be looking at love. Love. The four-letter word. Love. That's a beautiful word, Sindhu. It's a word that we love to hear. It's a, love that, it's a word that we like to be told. It's a word that could change everything. It could also, you know, it, it could shift many things. Just that simple four-letter word. I'm going to be looking at it from different uh, portions of scripture. Um, we're going to read quite a, big, uh, quite a bit, a few big chunks. So I hope you brought your Bible together with you. First uh, John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. I'm reading from the New King James. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. I'm going to take that again. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Now, if, you, if, you, if you're born again, if you, if you have any interest in Jesus at all, as you read this portion of scripture, it, it does something beautiful to your heart. It puts some hope inside of you. It's like you're looking forward to something. Um, I listened to someone, I think it was a bishop some time back, saying that hope changes you. A promise or hope changes you. And he was saying that it, can, it changes you to the extent such that um, it, it alters the decisions or it, it affects the way you make your decisions. For instance, if you are standing somewhere and somebody said to you that I will come by picking you to end a pamoja and a lift, when other matatus are coming, you do not get into those matatus because you know that there is someone that promised something to you. So you're going to stand there waiting for them until they finally come because a promise changes someone. You have hope and hope changes a person. As you're reading this, there's something that is inside of you. The idea is that you may get some hope of something that is coming. That's why we have these things that are written to us. Jesus speaking to his disciples, for instance, in John chapter 16, in verse 33, he says to them, I, do, I tell you these things so that your hearts may have peace, that in this world you will face tribulation. He's telling them, you need to be, you need to be prepared. Something is coming. But he says to them, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. He's saying to them that when the tribulations come, and they will, don't, um, don't act as if you did not know. But that's not what you're looking forward to. Your joy or your peace should be in this thing that I have overcome the world, in which the tribulation is. So let's go back to what we're reading. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. Now that simple word, behold, means look. It's like somebody telling you, Tazama, Angalia. So, scripture will tell us, behold, it's like calling our attention to it. Like, again, he says, behold, I am doing a new thing. And he asks, do you not see it? Do you not perceive it? So, he's calling your attention and says, behold. These days, people don't use the word behold. It is a bit of old English. If someone were to come and tell you, behold, what I am wearing, <laughs> you will wonder, um, from whence comest thou? Because that's the English that goes together with it. But when he says, behold, it's, he's calling your attention to something. It is as if he's addressing, or the, 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 the meaning of the word in Old English would be um, to address a distracted person. See, distracted, they're distracted, they're somebody whose focus is somewhere else. Now, if you were to go back to chapter 2, 
um, it talks about many different things. But as it comes to the end of, of, of chapter 2 in verse 28, he says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, you may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Then he says, Look what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. And then it says, therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Because um, we have become children of God. We are his sons and his daughters. Whatever we, we, we are called, scripture calls us co-heirs together with Jesus Christ. Whatever Jesus Christ is, that is what we have been made. That is what we are, co-heirs together with him. We are now sons. There is only this one begotten son. That's what the Bible says in John chapter 3 verse 16. That for God so loved the world that he gave his only, come on, this is Bible study. He gave his only begotten son. That whoever should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now, um, if you go back to, to, to John again, chapter 1, it, um, from verse, I think, 11, 12, it says that he came to the world and the world did not receive him. Um, the world received him not. But to all who received him and all who believed in his name, he gave them the power to be called children of God. That's you and me, beloved, that have believed in Jesus. That's you and me, beloved, that have accepted him. That is you and me that have received him inside of our hearts. Bonus, if you will. We are the children of God. It continues to say, children not born out of the will of the flesh, or children not just born out of the desire. It was not just a decision of boredom. It was not just that we were not oops babies in the kingdom. You know, an oops baby. Oops baby ni ule mtoto wa mkwa mmepanga alafu wa mekuja tu. Not you and your oops. Oops like, haya, okay. Imagine you're not an oops baby in the kingdom. And that means something to me. It means that God is on purpose. Well, that's not correct English. God is intentional, that's the word. <laughs> God is intentional about bringing me into this kingdom. About the fact that I have been born into the kingdom, that was not a mistake. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 will back that up because it says that we, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared for us long before we were born. God had good plans for me and you long before you were born. You are not oops. He had predestined that you will come into the kingdom and become a child, his own child. So he's saying, behold, look, the manner of love that the Father has given to us. And this is why it's supposed to be interesting, and we're going to see that in just a bit. Because if you consider the life, brethren, that you had, none of us were called because of how great we were. None of us were called into the kingdom because of how fitting for the kingdom, fit for the kingdom we were. Not you, not me, none of us. All of us have been saved by, by grace, through faith. We believed, and God remembered mercy upon us. I always constantly remember the example that Pastor Francis gave some time back about um, when he was speaking about uh, being brought into the camp, how we were not fit for the camp. We were outside of the camp. And what Jesus did is, is that he did not just stand at the entrance of the camp because he was fit for the camp. The camp was him and he was the camp, all right? He, was, he never sinned. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 that he went, this is a high priest that we have, not one who is not touched by the feeling of our infirmity, but one who was tested in every way, yet without sin. So Jesus was fit for the camp, all right? So he stood inside, he did not stand at the gate and say, yo guys, I talked to my father and he said, it's okay, you guys can come in. That's not what he did. He came right outside of the camp. And he came and he, he lived among us. And he, he did a beautiful thing just before he went back to heaven. He said when the temple curtain was torn into two, it meant we have access. We can now come right into where God is. If God is inside the camp, then we can go into the camp. We have been given, granted 100% access. Why? Because we are children of God. It's important that you understand that as we are talking about love. Because that's where it begins. That's, where, that's, that's the basic foundation of it all. But I was you Come on, born as if you If you were to look at the way your child behaves, for you that have children, um, or for you, okay, everyone is a child at, uh, here of someone. Um, when, when a child is here, and ukona wageni kwako, mtoto wakujangi anafika kwa mlango, anachungulia, anashindua, 
kuna wageni siwezi nikaingia sasa what will i do for instance or whatever or if you were to give the example of um the president for instance or let's even give an example that we can be able to relate with with bishop when he's here uh, if you, if you guys were here during family day of last year when we had the the one service and there were celebrations and we had invited guests and so on and so forth and um all the people were in this place this place was packed out and bishop was seated right there you see you can't just go up to bishop yourself now you okay you can't just go up to bishop and just be like Hey, Bishop, but there is something I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, the, when service is going on, you can't just do that. But there is um, Bishop's grandson, little Kimani. He walks up right to where Bishop is and he's saying, Guka, ile kitwe hizi kanguka. You know, they're having a conversation. Why? Because he understands fully he belongs to this family. So he has full access. Of course, as we continue to grow, we understand what honor is and that you, it is rude to interrupt and those kinds of things. But even when we learn those things, the idea is not so that we can be afraid of approaching. It's exactly what Pastor Francis was speaking to us about on Sunday, about showing mercy and receiving mercy. It doesn't mean that now these things, it is, not, it is not a religion of do's and don'ts, what we are in. It is a relationship that we have been brought into. It is a love relationship. Hallelujah. All right. So it says, you have now been called children of God, and therefore the world does not know us, because we are like our Father, because it did not know him either. It says, beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. And I thought that's an interesting um, phrase of scripture, or turn of phrase. It says, behold, now, beloved, now we are children of God. Right now, we are children of God. It has not been revealed what we are going to be. But right now, we are children of God. While we are here on earth, we are children of God. And that must mean something, beloved. That must mean something. Right now, while we are here, we are children of God. I don't think it sinks into us enough how weighty that statement is. That right now, we are children of God. My reaction cannot just be like, oh yeah, that's nice. No, it will be something else. It will change the way I think. It will change the way I speak, the way I talk to people, the way I walk around. It will change the way I interact with people. My everyday ordinary life in Romans chapter 12, it should be affected by the fact that I am a child of God. Such that, um, like we like to say with the young people, I can't just decide at a... Um, now salvation or this thing is a this spiritual thing. I can put it aside. Let's stop being spiritual now Let's talk about these other things. No, it has come into every part of my being it affects Let me give you an example. When we were in high school um, People used to talk very rudely. I don't know why maybe because it was an all-boys school I really don't understand but people were very rude um, for those of you that went to Okay to high school. Yeah um, I don't know whether you, you, you had the same experiences, but in my high school, boys were very rude. Any unge uliza tu mtu swali ya kujibu tu, yes or no. You know, people had to add some extra additives that were not good at all. But I remember in the Christian Union, our CEO patron was an old woman, Mrs. Waweru, and she used to say, if you're born again and you're in this place, it affects every part of yourself, even the way you speak. It will affect the way you respond to other people. And you're wondering, people are going to think I'm that boy who just is very soft and just tells people whatever. No, who can survive all for the fittest? But the truth of the matter is this. If you really, truly are born again, it should be known by the way you're speaking in the office. By the way you speak at your place of work. It doesn't matter. By the way, you could be in any field at all. Yesterday I was having a conversation with a young person. And he, was, he's, he used to be a student, a, a medical student. I'm a medicine student, student of medicine. He was studying medicine at the university. And then at, when he got to third year, he, halfway through, he dropped out of school. And so I asked him why did he drop out, and he said he dropped out because he wanted to serve the Lord with everything that he has. And so I was asking him, have you considered, for instance, that maybe the medical field is great mission field for you, which does not have many young, born-again, brilliant young minds, because not everybody has the opportunity of getting into med, med, med school. Yeah? Like, have you considered? Because it's not just about what we come to do here in church. Where you are in your office, that is mission field for you. In your family, that is mission field for you. That's why I may not be able to come and preach in your family because maybe you already ruined the name of Jesus Christ in that family. 
So tukikuja kwa family gathering, mweni leta, unasema, pastor, let's go to my family. And please, family yangu inakuanga hivi. So just speak a word uko. Nikikuja uko hata nikispeak words gani, hizo words as in mali kwa sababu wewe ndio mkristo waliona na ulisha haribu CV kitambo, CV ya yesu ulichukua ukararua mbele yao, wakaona hey, <laughs> kumbe hakuna kitu kama kuokoka. You know, I'm trying to say it's an everyday, everywhere thing. It must affect the way you think, the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you dress, the way you handle your finances. It must affect every area of your life. The way you, when I say handle your finances, I, I, I'm talking about things like ukikopa mtu unalipa. That is only vitu za kikristo. Hiyo ni mambo ya kiroho sana. Sema hiyo si kitu ya kiroho. Ah pesa una No, ni kiroho sana in fact. Ukiambia mtu please help me with um 2000, I'm going to give it back to you uh next week on Wednesday. I am not supposed to come and tell you it is Wednesday, give me back my money. You are a believer. You have the mind of Christ. In fact, you can't forget. You have been empowered. Bona <laughs> sifiwe. But you know, um, let us uh, keep moving. Whoever commits sin, <coughs> it's, it continues. Oh, it says, and everyone who has hope in him uh, purifies himself just as he is pure. Before that, it says this. Uh, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. And it continues to give instructions, and I would uh, invite you to continue reading it as you, go, as you go home. Because I want to skip just a bit and go to verse 16. And it says, by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and we and shall assure our hearts before him. And to just take a few few minutes on that because this is a bit instructional and it's a bit personal and um, not personal for me only it's personal for you as well as in personal as you read it 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 it, it involves you in a kuhusu um by this we know love because he's laid he laid his life for us we've just gone through john chapter 3 verse 16 that says god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so jesus himself gave himself up and said, no, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to do, go and die for these people. I'm going to give my life for them because I cannot imagine being separated from them forever. That, that's not, no. I, 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 or, or it is not a good thing for them to be separated forever. It is the love of Jesus that looked at, at what the end looks like. The end looks like condemnation without Jesus. The end looks like doom. The end looks like despair. The end looks like pain and sorrow and anguish in hell forever. That's what the end looks like without Jesus. So Jesus looked at it and said, I cannot imagine that these people would go to that end without a remedy. So I'm going to provide a remedy. I'll lay my life down. And I will take all their punishment for them. So that then they can come in and have access to what we have. That's what Jesus did. And that is love. Scripture says there is no, um, there, there's, there, there's no, um, what, what, what manner of love, I'm trying to put it in the, in the, in the right words. Uh, there's no amount of love uh, greater than this, that than any man would take his life and lay it down for his friends. That's what Jesus did. He took a a, a huge move, the hugest ever. We can actually, that's why we are able to say today, no, none of us can outgive God. It doesn't matter how many millions you have and decide you're going to give them to God. None of us can outgive God because he gave his own life, laid it down for you and for me. People that would, would hurt him in the, in the future. People that will reject him. People that will spit in his face. Here's an interesting fact. Did you think, did you consider, or do you consider that as Jesus was hanging on that, on that cross, he was paying for the sins of even the people that were actually spitting in his face? He was paying for the sins of the people that were putting the pierce in, that were putting the, 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 the spear in his side. He was paying for the sins of those people that were laughing and jeering at him. That kind of love that was looking past all his emotions and all the things that he thought he needed at that time. All the comfort of heaven. And he was saying, for this one, I am going to die. That they will not go to an, a total, an end of total uh, condemnation or damnation. Buwana iswa sifiwe. Bado tuko pamoja. It says, by this we know love because he laid his life down for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. 
Because that's what he did, and we are learning from him. He says, um, take my yoke and learn from me, because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He says, learn from you. As you walk with Jesus, you're learning from him. And we can't just want to learn the good things, or what we think are good things, which is the easy things. We can't just want to learn the easy things. Like, hmm, I could like to learn to just pray for many hours like Jesus. That sounds very spiritual, isn't it? And that's a good thing. Let's learn to pray for those many hours. So, okay, I'd like to know how to learn from Jesus, how to calm the storm. I'd, I'd really like to do that. That's a good thing. And we can learn that. Okay, I'd like to learn how to just walk into a room with somebody who is sick and say to them, Talitha Kumai. Just say to them, daughter, arise. Okay, that would be nice. Okay, I want to learn from you. Those are good things. But then there's also the difficult things. When I was doing my school of leaders, there's a book I read um, called 10 Things I Wish Jesus Never Said by a guy called, a pastor called Victor Kuligin. In those things, it's a really interesting book. I would recommend it. 10 Things I Wish Jesus Never Said because it paints the picture of what true Christianity is. Yeah? Like Jesus saying, uh, turn the other cheek when somebody comes to strike you. <laughs> I wish he never said that because it's not easy to do. Or saying that if it is your eye that is causing you to sin, you would rather just take it out. That is not an easy thing. But there are things that we love when Jesus says, or we love when the Bible says, I shall contend with those that contend against you. Yes, Lord, contend with my contenders. Those are good things. But we need to also learn these things that are seemingly uncomfortable because right there also is a true life. So he says that um, because he laid his life down for us, we also ought, and ought is like obligatory. It is, it is, it is almost a, it is a must. Yeah? It is very instructional. We ought to lay our lives down for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods, and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? And I remember some time back... Um, the bishop speaking to us, I don't remember when it was, I think, I think 2017, and he was speaking to, to members of the ministry team, saying that sometimes you're praying with a member and they come and tell you the way their need is a need of like 300 shillings. And they are crying and they are weeping and they are wailing. And you will pray with them, yes. But you know very well you have 300 shillings in your pocket. You, you are trusting God maybe for um, some amount, but it's definitely not 300 shillings. If you give the 300 shillings to you, you will not die. To him, sorry, you will not, you would not die, yeah. And so, for you to pray for that person and let them go, and you know you could have their solution, maybe not giving them money all the time because then again, that's not very sustainable. But if you have the solution to a person's problem, that's not very right. Allow me to just um, take the challenge a bit higher, and this is something I'm constantly saying, especially to the young people, that if you know you're seated in this place and you have. There's a, there's a gap that you usually see in church. There's a certain gap that you usually see. Something is not going very right. Viti is in a kwanga zijapangwa vizuri sana on Sunday. And you, you see that. You might be the solution that this church has. So the fact that you're seated there, you're holding love from us. You're holding love in action uh, from us. You're not doing us a good thing. So no, you're not doing us a favor. Your critical eye is just hurting you alone. Well, it's hurting us also, but you know. Bonas <laughs> here. Whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in this person? Because it's as simple as that. Jesus gave all things for us. Here's a statement that Bishop Jimmy made during the, um, the, the last year's encounter. He said, was it last year or last year but one? Sorry, last year but one. He said, knowing all the things that God, that Jesus gave so that we would be free so that we would be forgiven, so that we would be set free forever. Knowing all that, what then is so big that I wouldn't give it also myself? In full knowledge of what Christ has done for us. And if you read the book of Ephesians, Paul is constantly saying to them, in full light, therefore, brethren, of what God has done for you, in view of what God has done for you, in full understanding of what God has done for you, in full understanding of what the love of God means for us, because his love means that he gave everything just so that he could take us in. He, there's nothing that was too huge for him. What then would be so grand that you wouldn't give it away? 
And that doesn't just mean the, the physical possessions. It means the small things, the habits. It means the, 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 the language, for instance, like I've given you the example about my high school. It means the, the small things, the, the little things that t easily trip you up. What is that? What comforts are those? I was reading Luke chapter 14, I think Luke chapter 14, if I'm not wrong, um, the story about the parable of the great feast. And um, it's an interesting story because the, the, uh, Jesus gives this parable and says there's a man, a master that threw a feast and he sent uh, his servants to the people and said to them, listen, go and call the people and tell them the feast is now ready. And one by one, the people started giving excuses. And one of them said, I can't come because I have bought a piece of land and I have to go and survey it. And the second one said, I'm sorry, uh, I can't come because I have just bought five teams of oxen and I have to go and check them out. And the third one says, I can't come, I'm sorry, because I have just married a new wife. And the, and the Bible says, the master was very angry with these people. And so he said to, this, to the servants, go out and bring as many people as you can find and bring them in. And the servants did that and came back and said, there's still room. And then he says, no, go out again to the highways and the byways, go to the alleys and the streets, go to the villages, go everywhere and bring as many people. All the lame people and the broken people, the dislocated people, the dysfunctional people, go and bring them in so that my house may be full. Because I assure you of this one thing, none of those that I had invited at first will be invited, will, are welcome to my feast. That story has always been very interesting to me. And I reason, one of the reasons is because I, did, I, I never understood why the master was so angry. Why would the master be angry about people not coming to a feast? So in a bit of reading, I realized that in that, in, in that time's culture, in the day of Jesus, in those days, it was customary that if I have a party, most times it is the same way today, but those days it was a bit more serious. If I have a party, I'm going to, say, to send out invitations to all of you, okay, as many of you that I want to come, okay? Uh, I will send invitations and say, I have a party on the 16th of um, November. For instance, on the 16th of November, we have Ibada here for all the young people. Um, I say, we have a party um, at my house. Please come on the 16th of November. I won't tell you the time. I'm just telling you. So what you're going to do is that you're going to confirm or say that you're not available. So because I am sending the servants, the servants will come. At that moment, you're telling them, I am available. Then you tell them, as they come to invite you, long way in advance, you're saying, I'm not available. I'm not available. So this is what then used to happen. On the day of the party, only the people that confirmed initially would be counted for. Tukopamoja? Only the people that had confirmed initially. Nikama vinyu natumiyango akadi ya Rusi alafu palachini meandikwa RSV. P, I think in French it's respondez s'il vous plaît. Like, please respond. I, oh, rice and soup, very plenty. It could mean whatever you want it to mean. But it, the idea is, um, when you get this card, please confirm that you're coming, which most of us don't do. Um, I think it is good manners to begin to confirm. Yeah. But anyway, uh, these people used to confirm or say, I'm not coming. So that when they, on the day of the party, the person that's planning, the master, is planning with you in mind. That would explain why he was so angry, because the people that said now they are not coming to the party are people only that had already confirmed, people that have been prepared for. People that had been invited, in, in Jesus' example now, people that had been invited to the kingdom and already said, yes, I am available. And then now, he's inviting them to come and spend time with him, and they're saying, no, I'm not coming. Here's another thing. The people that are saying they're not coming, the reasons they are giving are interesting reasons. One of them says it's a piece of land, I can't come. The other one says it's a team of oxen, I can't come. The other one says it's a wife, I can't come. Notice that all these things are good things. There is none of these things that is a sinful thing. A piece of land is a good thing to have. Say my amen. <laughs> a team of oxen, well, even now, if you have a team of oxen, that's some good money, yeah? And a wife, I mean, I think that's a good thing to have, yeah? <laughs> Oh, it's, it's a good thing to have, yeah? Okay, yeah. You know you're like silent, so gloomy. Um, so I'm like, I, Connie, it's not a good thing. <laughs> it's a good thing to have. Notice that these are good things that are causing these people to say no. In fact, you would be correct to assume or to think that 
the things that keep these people from coming to fellowship, or the example that Jesus was giving, the things that are keeping these people from coming to the, to the master's banquet uh, table are good things. They are not bad things. Similar to us, the things that keep us from coming to fellowship with Jesus that will be more and more like him are not bad things, not necessarily, not all the time. Half the time it is the bad things. Those are things that we're being told flee from. For instance, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, when it says, flee from youthful passions and other lusts, other form of lusts, run away from them, bad things that could keep you from the banquet table, like could tie you down completely, trip you up, the sins that so easily beset you, those things. But then there's also the, 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 the good things, the very blessings of God, the very gifts of God that could keep you from the banquet table, from the Lord's um, banquet, banquet table. When I see Here's what, here's what I'm trying to get at. That it's, it's important that, that we realize that the things that could keep us from enjoying or sharing God's love are not necessarily bad things, not all the time, no. They are the comfortable things, the things that we love so dearly. Anything that causes us not to inch closer to Jesus Christ. Those things are the things we're supposed to be asking ourselves. What is this that is so great or so good or so pleasurable that I wouldn't give it? Because most times when we say that statement that I wouldn't give it to God or give it away so that God would have his time with me or have his place inside of my life. Most times when we're making that statement, we think of the sinful, terrible things. And so we leave the small, good, nice, comfortable things that could easily trip us up to remain those things. Here's an example. I love to read. Just I love to decide what I love to decide for myself what I'm reading. So I mean that doesn't mean when I was in school I used to love reading biology or chemistry. I used to spend a lot of my time in the classroom reading um, nice books by Chinua Achebe and things like The Moon Also Sets and those old books, those really nice creative whatever <laughs> you know. But there's an, an entire unit of chemistry, not unit, chapter of biology that's waiting for me. And I don't want to read this one. I want to read this book. Yeah? So I enjoy. Those are some of the things that I do in my favorite, in my, in my favorite things to do in my pastime, for instance. So sometimes I will wake up and after I have done a bit of my Bible study, I, do not, I will not mind just getting into a book that I am currently reading and just read it and read it and just flip the pages and read it and enjoy and take tea while reading it and have lunch while reading it. I won't mind doing that at all. But my Bible study will come to an end at some point, palembele, before I start reading this book. That's not a bad thing to like to read, but the fact that this, these are small things that I might easily overlook. Um, there's a guy called John Flavel, um, from a long time ago, he used to say, he says this thing, and he says, what, we, you need to call your mind or your heart every evening, and every so often, you need to call yourself and ask yourself, where have you been today? Could you not abide by the fountain of delights, who is Jesus Christ? And did you find more pleasure in the created than in the creator? Not in only the bad things, even in your relationships, like the man that said he's not able to go because he's married a wife. Those are the things that could keep us from this love of God because he has poured his love out so lavishly. Not bad things, beloved. Not, or I should put it this way, not just the bad things. All right, let's keep going. It says, but whoever has um, this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? He says, my little children, let us not love the in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. He says, let us not love just in word or in truth. And that will take us to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which we know, um, which most of us might know as the love chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. All right, it's right there on the screen. So he says, let us not just love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Not just in word or in tongue, but in deed 
and in truth. Think about what that must mean for you as an individual. Think about what that must mean for you as a Christian. For you in that plot where you live, think about what that must mean. Having understood that Jesus gave everything, because that is it, that God so loved the world, you and me, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus allowed himself to move and come because I believe he was, he was, it's not like, don't you think for a second he was kicked out of heaven and told you must go and die for these people and he came here because he couldn't do anything. No. So he, this is an act of love, a, a, a well put together act of love. And so you are the recipient of that love. You and me are the recipients of this love. So we understand that love is that which does not withhold anything at all. It is considering the welfare of other people before even yourself. All right? Or higher than yourself. If you consider the example of Jesus, it must be that Jesus did not consider um, his own welfare, really, when he was leaving the comfort of heaven. No. He was considering the welfare of the church because he was looking at, where would my bride be if I do not go down? And so he considers, let me go down so that I may have them to myself, so that I may make a way for them to come back because we had been separated, so that there would be no longer, there would no longer be eternal separation. In, if you go to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, he's giving the example now of the husband and the wife, and he says to the husband, husbands, do what? Love your wives as Christ loved the church or continues to love the church. And that is a high, high calling. But it is a doable thing because of Jesus. All right? So he says, let us not just love in word or in tongue, but in truth and in deed. Here's what it means. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 13, verse 1. It says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sound, I've become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I should remove mountains, but I don't have love, I am nothing. And though I should bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I live, I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Let us not just love, to, to take it from First uh, John, uh, let us not just love in words or in tongue, but in truth and in deed. <laughs> not just when it is away from us and does not touch us, especially also when it touches us as well. Remember the example that Pastor Francis gave on Sunday, talking about how um, some of us in the office, somebody comes and tells you, oh, my daughter has gotten, you know, pregnant and she's not married. It's out at, um, you know, outside wedlock and it's just really devastating. And you tell them, oh, let me come and visit. Please, you even take a fruit basket. Um, uh, like Pastor Beatrice knows how to prepare a really nice, good fruit basket. You take a fruit basket to them and you're like, oh, don't worry. This is not the end of life. You know, Jesus loves you. It is not a good thing what you've done. It is not right at all. Uh, but if, you, if we can rise from this, you don't have to dwell in this thing and we can move on and, you know, and in Jesus. And, you know, you even begin to disciple this person. You have regular meetings together with them. And then you go back home and, and your daughter tells you, mom, um, something happened and you know I'm, I'm pregnant <laughs> like hey. hey and you call your sister because that's what mothers do you call your sister and you tell her your your children have decided to come and kill me in this Nairobi <laughs> because all mothers read from the same handbook <laughs> so consider that not just when it doesn't touch you but also especially when it touches you. Not just when you're talking about other people. You see, um, and, and I've had, growing up here uh, in this church, I've had Bishop say this many, many times, that if you don't have a child that is in teenage yet, don't you be pointing fingers at other children, that other parents whose children are, are teenagers. You're saying, oh, this one doesn't even know how to bring up children. In fact, Your children are just crawling around here because you're the one that dresses them. Wait until they start nini. You know, after they have gone through ropes and they are now adolescents and they are throwing their hair, you know, and they are swinging more than you can swing. 
than you ever did swing when they come into service. Just wait, and then now you start to say. You go to the same pastor, and you're telling him, because that's I'm to work, I'm you know, you know, professional person, she's working, she has accepted even Jesus. You now you're coming to the same pastor, and you're saying, my children, <laughs> my children. <laughs> so consider this, beloved. <laughs> How about loving in deed and in truth? What would that mean? That's a question I would throw to us. And it's a good thing because we get to discuss this thing at the home cell level. What would that mean for us? Loving in truth and in deed. Because I think it will be a beautiful thing. Jesus will smile from heaven if as a church, as a body of Christ, and if we started right here in the DCIKZ family, if we started to love in truth and in deed, what will that mean? And you would answer that question at the family level. You would answer that question um, in your office. You would answer that question in your ministry, in your department, in the cell, wherever it is that you serve. What would it mean to love in truth and in deed? Because it would go down to address every detail of your life. What would it mean if I, as Moshegadi, loved in truth and in deed? One of the things comes to the top of my head, maybe because of my training in school. Um, things like... And this is set to show you how wide and deep it goes, the love of Jesus Christ inside of us. Things like when you're done eating your, or taking your yogurt, when you're long distance traveling, going to Busia, Eldoret, Mombasa, you're done taking your yogurt. You don't just finish with your yogurt and throw the nini outside the moving vehicle because you as the citizen of Kenya are paying your taxes and the county government is paying people to come and sweep. And so the roads will be swept and kept clean. No, you're thinking about what, what does it mean for me to love in truth and in deed. It means that there are other people that are dwellers of that area that I'm throwing my trash in. And even if there are no other people, like that place is just inhabited by monkeys and warthogs, it, it, those things need some clean environment. And imagine if you threw your own and your other person, and in a bus of 53 people, all of them threw their yogurt, that becomes a dumping site. How did it start? With a loving believer that loves Jesus with all their heart, their mind, their soul. They are singing praises to the Lord God Almighty. But we have not, we are just loving in tongue and in words. We are not loving in truth and in deed. What will it mean for you to love in truth and in, 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 in truth and in actions? Yeah? What will that mean for you at every level? It will mean that you get into a matatu and the conductor wants to say some things and you let them say those things because you are not, you, you don't, you don't throw <laughs> words at them. Here's an interesting story. Just before I came here, and to Nairobi Hospital to see someone. And as I was coming back, um, there was a lot of traffic. And <laughs> someone just um, swerved and cut me off in a really bad way. And there were police officers right there. And, I, I, and then there was traffic. He didn't go anywhere. So he was stuck between me and the other car. And I had already moved forward. So he needed me to move back, reverse, so that he could go that way. And so the police officer came and said to me, Boss, I'm <laughs> I'd like to report that I almost did not pass the test. Well, I passed, kind of passed. <laughs> because I, I stopped there and I was like, I'm about to just disembark from this car and teach this police officer a lesson in good civics. And just tell him, how are you aiding and abetting law-breaking in this country? Do you know that at Deliverance Church International Kasarani, we pray for the leaders we want? And the <laughs> but I didn't do that. Um, I ended up reversing. But I was thinking in myself, I am reversing with my actions. But what am I doing in my heart? In my heart, I am inching closer. I am moving closer. I am actually just touching the car enough to put a good dent on it, you know, just even funzo kwake na kwa ingine onye tabia kama yake. I'm trying to say that this thing goes so deep. It is such a deep, deep thing. It should affect our thoughts, our intentions, our impulses, everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because the knowledge of Jesus Christ says that we are loved deeply. We are accepted deeply. We are affirmed deeply by a God or a Father without rival. 
there is a place inside of God for you. There is a place inside of the church for you. That's what the Bible says in Colossians chapter 1 from 16 going onwards. In the message it says that so spacious is he and so roomy is he that everything in the world finds its place in him. The broken, the dislocated things and people of the world, they find their place in him. He loves us so much that there is room inside of him for everyone. I remember something that Bishop said while I was up some time back, a long time ago, and he said, uh, it's, he quoted the line of a song, the, the hymn, To God Be the Glory, and he said, the vilest offender, like the most terrible offender, who truly believes, that moment from Jesus, he receives a pardon. That is how spacious and roomy Jesus is. So imagine, that is the one we are learning from. How much more ought we to share love or to give love? Buenas if you Not just in words or in a tongue, but in actions, in truth, that's how we're supposed to love. What would it mean for you to love? To, if you were to cascade it down to every level of your life, what would that mean? Sometimes I would say for me it would mean that I don't have to wear some clothes until they have some holes inside of them. I would just, you know, decide, okay, this one I can pack it properly and give it to this brother or to this sister or to this. Bonas if you Sometimes it would mean um, for, me to sit, <laughs> for me to sit inside of, of, of public transport, for instance, and if, if I'm using public transport, and, and pay for that brother. Be the first one to volunteer to pay for them. But most of us, unezo kastema, unafinya, unakanyaga, naya kanyage, unafinya, it's like a competition. Wacha tuone nani atakubali kwanza. Mwenye atapigwa na Sony zaidi, ni watasema, sister, I have paid for you. Amen, God is working for me. What will it mean for me to love in truth? Because that is why Jesus came. That we would be reconciled together with him. Now I want us to understand that reconciliation to him or having access to him does not just mean it is a me thing. That's why he did not come to die for one part, for one human being like this. No, he died for all humanity, as many of us that will accept him and receive him. The body of Jesus Christ, the bride of Christ, the church. You're not going to heaven alone. That's why you must live peaceably with other men and you must show love to them. The truth should be this, that because of our actions of love, we should be able to, 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 to show love so deeply that other people outside looking at us desire to know what is it about these people. That Kwaploti, and I know I've given this example here many times, but I'm not going to stop now. In your in the flat where you live, for instance, when you're doing your laundry, are you thinking about when you're hanging your clothes, it goes down to the basic things like those. When you're hanging your clothes that are jeans, zako ambazo zinamua garangi, unangalia pale chini ninguza nani zimeanikwa? Lakini when sama mikwa ni hii plot miss ya kuja Nairobi kulea mtu, so unaeka tu hivi nguza zako unazianika, diaper za watoto napi huko chini zinamuagikiwa, sama hai, mtu kama anasikia napi zinamuagikiwa na majis, ya nundia mtoto pampas. Sama, ah, our Christo, 80% Christian is this our country. <laughs> Who are those 80%? It is us and then our neighbors. Basic, basic things. The love of Jesus Christ is not supposed to just be for a church thing. When we come into church, we lift our hands, we dance around this place, we raising our small white dominion flags. I don't know where those flags went, but we had small flags written dominion in the old church. We used to dance around with them here. It, that is good. It means that, but also your everyday ordinary life. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. In the message, it says, so therefore, brethren, here's what I want you to do. Take your everyday, ordinary life and place it before God as an offering. Because this is your spiritual act of worship. Your spiritual act of worship is not the way you just come and speak in tongues in this place. The way you fast 40 days in a year, or 40 plus 21, which is what you usually do most of the time. Those, those 61 days of the year, that's not just your spiritual act of worship. That's okay. But imagine fasting and then you're not sharing love. You're not showing the love of Jesus Christ. It should be that you should preach Jesus Christ wherever we, you go, but only if you must use your words. Preach Jesus Christ wherever you go, but only if you must use your words. That should mean that from the moment I wake up in the morning to the, times that I, to the time that I will go back into bed in the evening, I should have preached Jesus Christ whether or not I had the opportunity to stand here with this microphone. As I drive on the roads, as I walk, as I talk with my neighbors, as the gate is opened for me in the mall, as I come and sit in the office together with my colleagues, I should be able to preach Jesus. That would mean even my work ethic should be affected. And allow me to end by saying this, and I gave this example in the, in the youth um, network. 
as a Christian, it cannot be that the love of Jesus Christ has come inside of you. So you are, you are ablaze. You're on fire for Jesus. On fire. You're waking up in the morning. You've spoken in tongues. First of all, you woke up at your own time because you decided to wake up at three and pray. And then you slept kidogo. And then you overslept. So you know what happens. And so you woke up and you showered. And you in the car, you were just praying in tongues. And you were just, and that's a good thing. And then you got into the office at like, um, you know, 10 and you went to the office and you sat down and you opened your big uh, purple Bible that is written the sword of the spirit. You know that big Bible? It's really good. The font is good if you have a, an eye problem. And you open it up and you start to read it and that's great. And your colleagues got into the office maybe at nine, yeah? Maybe you have flexi time. They are working and they're doing their thing. You mingi at 10, umefanya Bible study, yako 10, hadi 11, you have bowed your head and prayed for a proper amount of time, and that's good because you're a great believer, you're a good Christian, and then you have decided that um, sasa ni wakati wa kutendesha yo nini kazi, karama zako kazi. And so you go, not door to door, so you go desk to desk evangelizing, sharing the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ because the Lord has placed you in the marketplace. Wonderful. And so you go and you move from this desk and you show them, by the way, um, Dan, uh, unajua na kuambia ngei maleno ya kuokoka? Unajua, una, nipo ukiokoka, ukiokoka kubali yesu? If this person does not say yes, I want to accept Jesus, it is probably not because they don't want Jesus. It might be because, anataka kufanya kazi ndio alipo mwisho wa mwezi, na una msumbua. <laughs> I'm trying to say that the love of Jesus Christ is supposed to affect every area of our lives. If, if we were to read it without a hurry, if we were to consider it without, while not in a hurry, we will sit down and ask, what does it mean that Jesus has loved us so much? What responsibility do we have? The responsibility is to love him with all our hearts and then to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. See, that is it. So what does that mean in practical terms? What? It's not just a head thing. It's also in our heart. It's also in our hands as we are working with people. It's also in our feet as we are walking. It's also in our body, on our skin. It's everywhere. What does it mean? Here's the, the fun part of all this. That it is, abs it is not difficult. It is absolutely impossible for you to know what it means unless you go back to the Holy Spirit. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. But it says the fruit of the Spirit is love. There is no way you're going to know how to give love if you don't go back to the one that gives it. That's the fun part about all of this. Because right now we might sit in this place and feel like, hey, get to him, every area of my life, that is a good thing to have that feeling because you realize you cannot do it alone. You need a savior. And that's why Jesus came, because we needed a savior. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you because you're good and because besides you there is no one else. We thank you because you have spoken to us today at length. We ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you will follow up the words that you have spoken to us through me and the words that you have also spoken to us individually, O oh God by your power, and that you will follow them up and do them, my Father, causing us to be more like you, more like you, Jesus, because we just want to be more like you. That, dear God, we will think about what it means for us to accept your love, because you have loved us so extravagantly. It would mean that we need to love you back with all our hearts, minds, and souls, but also that we also need to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. It takes your Holy Spirit to teach us who our neighbor is. It takes the whole, your Holy Spirit, oh God, to show us how we should love our neighbors. It takes your Holy Spirit to show us when to do it and how to do it and who to do it with and how to go about all of it. We cannot do it alone. It is not just difficult. It is absolutely impossible to go it alone. But we thank you because we are never alone. Your promise to us has been because you love us so deeply, you are with us until the end of the age. Therefore, I pray that you honor your word and continue to do these things, O oh God, being with us and revealing yourself to us and give us the grace to open our hearts to you, to your instruction and to your correction because this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.